Hello, everybody, and welcome to day 17 of 28 days to Master Level Chess Tactics. We are in the middle of pinning, pinning and winning, and I'm going to give you two positions today. Uh, the first position is rather a warm-up with some forcing continuations, and then we're going to look at a higher-level example of how you'd use pins, not necessarily to blow your opponent away, but just to get a advantageous position or to win a pawn. All right, so this position is black to move, and you can pause the video now. Let's just get into it. Now, when I talk about the thought process, I talk about going from general to specific, and what I mean by that is noticing the main elements of the position or specific features that you have in a general context and that you could potentially use. Now, the first thing I noticed in this position was the open h-file for this black rook and it looks like black did give away some development with his king namely his king sitting in the center for this open file now he can use that but he has to look at specific forcing variations because otherwise everything's equal white is pretty well developed he has his queen sitting here and he's just about ready to bear down on this king uh, he does have his two bishops still and he's also threatening the queen so black has to look at the features of his position. Now, in addition to the rook here, there's also the bishop on c5 that is pinning this f2 pawn. And he's ready to come in with the bishop uh, in a couple moves. So what would you look at first? Well, you would have to reduce it to either you need to take the bishop here, or you need to move the queen, or you can take this pawn. Now, obviously, queen takes bishop. He just takes your queen. There's nothing good about that. I mean, obviously, you wouldn't play something like e5 because you could just take a check. You trade queens, you're down a pawn, uh, and there's no advantage there. You could just move your queen, but it's pretty passive. And it does put some pressure on f2, but it's not enough. And white's just going to open up everything anyway. Now, queen takes d5 is very interesting because obviously the bishop can take. And you do have a threat of mate in one. And... Because this pawn is pinned on f2, he can't move it. Now that, that sets up the entire mating pattern of this light square bishop and this rook on h1. Now if he does take, which is basically the only move, because if the queen comes, after queen takes d5, if the queen comes here, you just take the queen, he takes, and then you're going to have that mating pattern anyway. You just take, 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 and now there's no way to stop it. And if he tries to do anything else, just takes your queen, then he still can't do anything except throw a few pieces in your way, like bishop to h6, you take. He could give you a spite check or play queen to f3, queen here, but otherwise you're going to get that mate. And he's just one move too late, tries to move the rook, you get the mate. So a very interesting example of using a pin as well as the rook uh, h-file to get a mate on h1. Now, I do want to make a point, too, that a lot of times uh, the pins, as in day 16, the first example I showed, you're, you're really using pins to rather tie up the opponent's pieces, and that gives you access to a square that you otherwise wouldn't have access to. All right, let's get into the second position here. All right, this is a position as white from a Korchnoi game. He's playing white. And he uses a slight inaccuracy by his opponent to win a pawn by using pins. So let's see what he does here. Uh, it's white to move, and you can pause the video now. All right, so this is actually a position from the semi-slav opening. Uh, and black played queen to d from d8 to c7. Hitting this knight, he, he should have played queen to a5, uh, being a little more active, hitting this bishop. And eventually he could have played knight to e5 to try to protect this pawn. Now instead of that, that leaves a pinning example here for Korshnoi. So obviously black has a double attack on this uh, knight, but Korshnoi just ignores it. And he takes that pawn. So now he's won a pawn, and he's going to get very active. The knight takes, hits there, takes, takes. And now you see two pins here. The rook is pinning the knight to the queen, and the bishop is pinning the pawn uh, so that it can't move here and protect the knight. Otherwise, everything would be okay. Now, he can't play here because the bishop would just take the rook, and he'd lose material. And now he does have problems trying to hang on to his knight, but it's a little too strong in this position with all the pins. 
Now he has the pin on the rook and the bishop, and if he tries to protect it, like in the game, he brings the bishop back, he just brings in another piece, and he's going to win back with interest. So now he took, takes, and now white is a lot more active than that example if he played queen to a5. What The, the queens are still on the board, uh, he's a pawn up, and black now has some severe problems trying to develop, specifically this bishop and this rook are very inactive, and white has some threats as well with like bishop to or bishop takes on f7. Uh, so he protects. And now of course now he just consolidates. Uh, I'll just go very very quickly through this the rest of this game because it's not necessarily about pins, but I'll show you how he used this pin or used pinning on the c file as well as the bishop on d5 to gain a pawn and then we just go through Sets up a double attack with uh, rook to c5. Very nice. All right. And he basically just trades, attacks the queen. And he's using pawns that he's winning along the way to just set up a kingside attack. So it's not necessarily about the material or the pawns. It's more about the activity that he gets from it. So now he just creates a battery with a three-piece, uh, major piece battery. All right, so we'll just keep going here. All right, and then black resigned because he's down three pawns. Now, how did this happen? Well, he used that early pinning example to gain a pawn to tie up black, and in the meantime, he just kept winning material. Um, I'll post the game below if you want to look through it. From the beginning of this video, I give you a more forcing example because I do want to give some good practice covering that, but I also want to wanted to look in this example of how Many times pins are used to just gain some kind of positional advantage or at least a pawn and you use that to tie your opponent up and a lot of times I would say in this game Korshnoi kind of tricked his opponent into trying to hang on to that knight on c5 and because of that he just ended up very inactive in the end. All right, so this concludes day 17. Thanks for following along and I'll see you in day 18. Don't fret if you got the solution wrong. Another time